my name is Karen Mulhauser, and in a little bit more than a month, I will become the president of the local chapter, the DC area chapter of the United Nations Association. And I have to say that's a, a great honor. And in the last few months, it's given me the, the privilege and the honor to work with um, the planning committee for this, for this meeting. And so I want to thank the planning committee. And it's midway through the through the, the day, but I still I want to join the others in welcoming all of you to come to this conference. Um, I think the timing of this, this meeting is, is very, very appropriate for the kinds of discussions. I've learned so much today listening to our speakers and overhearing the conversation at my table with uh, Tom Miller, and I uh, want to welcome him to his new position uh, as the head of UNAUSA and his conversation with our speaker today. Um, so I want to say just a little bit about uh, what I hope will happen as I become uh, the, the president of the, the local chapter um, in reference to a comment that Savis made this morning. Uh, many of the people on the board of the United Nations Association National Capital Area know that I have been talking about wanting to um, bring the gender issues forward in the, some of the work that we're doing, both through our advocacy work, education work, and so forth. And I, uh, she convinced me that uh, rather than having a committee, we should mainstream those issues, uh, just as as she recommended happens at the at the United Nations. And uh, it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was a, 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 a couple of years that I spent in Italy, and my name in Italy, instead of Karen, was Karina, and so I will be Karina the Zarina of, uh, <laughs> of gender issues. Uh, and I, I, I have to say that the, the board that I have been working with so far uh, is, is a wonderful board, and, and uh, look forward to, to working further with them uh, in the, the months and years ahead. Uh, I, just commenting briefly on, on some of the comments this morning, I, I want to, uh, while it was a lot of very sobering comments about uh, the, the importance of reform and renewal of the UN, there were also occasional and very welcome remarks about uh, the, what I call that we live in a time of possibilities, the fact that there is a, an administration and, um, and and representation by Susan Rice in the United Nations that there, and a welcoming that we have all observed uh, from countries around the world as to what is possible with this new administration. That that does give us hope, and it's a it's a challenge for all of us who are looking forward to <laughs> realizing some new possibilities in the United Nations. And if other countries are uh, desiring for there to be greater U.S. engagement and that that might make a difference, as was suggested this morning, uh, we are at that time. And there will be a need by this administration for the support of the kinds of people represented in this room and the organizations to which we belong. I, I now have the great uh, honor of introducing our speaker, and uh, this luncheon uh, time will demonstrate the very uh, nonpartisan nature of the planning group and the work of this of this day. I uh, I did myself uh, work in the uh, Obama administration as a senior advisor, and our speaker has worked uh, in not in the administration, in the campaign, as a senior advisor to the campaign. <laughs> no, there's no, this is not a public announcement of something new that, that even the Post did not reveal. <laughs> I worked in the campaign, and our, our esteemed speaker has worked in the campaign uh, for uh, the Bush-Janey election. He's also had a very distinguished career in many public service uh, positions, uh, working at, with the United States government in uh, both the, the Reagan and the first Bush administrations uh, as, 
the um, assistant to the president for intergovernmental affairs. And he's also worked at the US State Department. And uh, most recently, by the uh, second President Bush, he was appointed in, in 2008 as, as a special envoy to Sudan. He's also had uh, exper various experiences working in the United Nations and in uh, non-governmental non organizations as well. And so he brings a, a, a great breadth and depth of experience uh, to his, the remarks that he's going to be giving today. And um, so we're looking forward to, to hearing his remarks. And uh, I ha I'll have a few announcements after his remarks. But at this point, I'd like to uh, have you join me in welcoming our speaker, Ambassador Richard Williamson. Thank you, Karen. As Karen indicated, part of my function in life is to go to events related to the UN and be the token Republican. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Karen. I want to also welcome uh, Ambassador Tom Miller, who's the new uh, president of the United Nations Association of the United States of America, on whose board I once sat. And uh, Tom has a distinguished career as ambassador to Bosnia and Greece involved in Middle East talks, and uh, we're delighted that he's been willing to accept this. And his most important characteristic is he went to Nutra High School, as did I. So <laughs> thank you. I thank Princeton Lyman, who's been a friend and colleague for years, Toby Makuro, for helping sponsor uh, this. My old friend David Birnbaum, who does a lot of good work on the UN, not only when he was in office in the Clinton administration, but here at the Wilson Center. And uh, Paul Kavanaugh, who I haven't seen since we both were in New York. It's good to see you, Ambassador. Um, the other day I heard a story I want to repeat because I think it has some relevance to one of these in unending evergreen meetings on UN reform. and. Uh, you know, we all know how tough the economy is, and, and uh, the story goes that in Texas, with land uh, prices getting so low, there's a rancher that bought all the ranches around him. Then he bought the ranches around that, and then he bought the ranches around that, and somebody in town asked him what he's calling uh, his ranch, and he said, I'm calling it the Triple R, Red River, Broken Arrow, Deep Hollow, Trekkie River, Moose Horn, Alta Meadow, Hidden Valley, Whispering Oaks, Double D Ranch. So, wow, it's so big, you must have a lot of cattle. He said, well, actually, the branding killed most of them. <laughs> uh, UN reform is branded in a tough way. So I'm glad that we have strengthening in this thing, too, So just another UN reform. But, but we are at a unique opportunity, I think, with the new administration and with some of the challenges that have come front and center. Uh, while America does ha has been diminished uh, with our economic problems, with the emergence of China, mistakes and mismanagement in uh, some conflict zones, Nonetheless, the United States remains the greatest power in the world with the capacity to project power and force to all corners of the world, and no one else does. But at the same time, we have limits to US power. We did before the last 10 years. We do today because there are, because there are limits in Treasury, blood, and political support. And so we need multilateralism to deal with a lot of issues. We lost sight of that from time to time uh, in our history, arguably in the last eight years. There's a story about Muhammad Ali right after he had won the world championship. He'd already gotten the gold medal at the Olympics, got the world championship. He just changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. He was uh, had a big personality and a lot of, of uh, bragging tendencies, and he's on a plane, and the pilot comes on, please fasten your seat belts, and everybody does it but him. And so the stewardess goes up to him and says, excuse me, sir, would you please fasten your seat belts? 
And Muhammad Ali gets a big smile and he says, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> and the stewardess says, Superman don't need no plane. <laughs> um, <laughs> we lost sight of even with our power and position, there were limitations in what we could do. And furthermore, it bears noting, it's something Tom Pickering raised earlier, that there's some important problems, some of the more important emerging problems that lend themselves to unilateral answers. They're better dealt with unilaterally than, I mean multilaterally than unilaterally, not only nonproliferation, and Tom talked a little bit about that, but the environment, as was talked about, endemic disease, et cetera. But I think whenever you have talk about the UN, especially in the context of strengthening and reforming it, we have to step back and try to understand because no one and no country doesn't act in what they think is their, their uh, self-interest. And some of the speakers this morning say, well, they just don't understand their self-interest. I, I don't get that. I guess it's because I'm not smart enough to know what other people or other countries' self-interest is. They're doing what they think is in their interest, and your job is to try to understand their perspective and why they think it's in their interest. Not something that the United States is particularly good at. And part of it is in the UN, there's a huge asymmetry. The US, because it is big, because it has this economic might, this cultural reach, this military capacity, has this huge foreign policy toolbox. It's full of military options, it's full of economic options, it's full of diplomatic options, and it's full of multilateral options. And the UN's one of them. It doesn't define US foreign policy. It's not the most important one. People like Princeton, who've been Assistant Secretary for International Organizations, has experienced that you're not the first one they call um, when they're uh, dealing with most global challenges. But for every other country in the world, it's more important than it is to us. And for over 100 of them, it is the dominant foreign policy tool. They don't have anything else in their foreign policy toolbox. They can talk to their direct neighbors, send someone to Geneva so they can talk to a bunch of folks there and maybe a handful of other places because of a unique economic link or something. The UN's it. So you always have an asymmetry in discussions and negotiations, whether it's on substantive issues, the institution or reform, because we approach it as a less central tool. They approach it as the dominant consideration of how they participate in the global community. And within multilateral institutions, as people interested in the UN, let's remind ourselves, there's NATO, the Organization of American States, WTO, World Bank, IMF, G8, G20, and UN, to name a few. I remember I was Assistant Secretary when the uh, G7, for the first time, had a topic on its agenda that wasn't economic. It had started in 1973 when George Shultz had called the foreign ministers, and they actually met in the basement of the White House. That's how the G7 started. Now they spend a half billion dollars just on security when they meet. <laughs> um, that sounds like the UN, actually. Um, <laughs> and, and in 1988, they, brought, they, had, they, they put on the agenda international drugs. And I remember thinking, you know, this is going to change. There's going to be more issues. And as we've seen the G20 created and other things, the fact is there's a whole bunch of tools. And so as we talk of the UN, I would argue you got to focus on what its unique assets are. And it has important and unique assets. Principally, it's universal membership. It gives it a, a capacity, a reach, an acceptance, I hate this word, a legitimacy that no other institution has. And it has an acceptance because of the role it played in decolonization because of what's in the charter, because of its work on human rights, et cetera. 
And that particular legitimacy and reach and convening capacity gives it a unique ability to do things the U.S. wants done, like norm setting. Human rights is a one that's pointed to, but we saw this in counterterrorism after 9-11. The U.N. had a capacity to address an issue and say, no, it is not acceptable to harbor terrorists. Now, it was made light of earlier today, but absolutely right that they can't agree on a definition of terrorism because of the unique challenge and politicalization of the Israel-Palestine question. Fair enough. But it did more to create certain international norms on counterterrorism and certain mechanisms that no one else could. Countries that cannot accept support from the United States to build their internal capacity for border control, for passport control, can accept it through the UN and through the UN those capacities and benefits are provided. The old saw of the technical specialized agencies, IAE, WFP, and I'll tell you, in, in Sudan today, the WFP just does a heroic effort in delivering assistance. And it was actually under an American, Catherine Bertini, in the 90s that the World Food Program grew from a pretty good organization to a great one. We are the largest donor, but it is efficient, it is effective, it takes chances, it delivers food. A KO, et cetera. And I'll say, having suffered through way too many Security Council meetings and listened to too many speeches to ever want the UN Security Council lengthened because it's already cruel and puni unusual punishment to listen to the other 14 speeches every, on every topic. And the least significant the country, the longer the speech has to be because they have to assert their right to be, I guess. But nonetheless, the Security Council does really important stuff and has made a contribution. That doesn't mean it doesn't screw up a lot, but then again, we're from the United States, so we know institutions screw up. Um, the General Assembly's a pain. It's a difficult venue. There's all kinds of political mischief. It does stuff that's counterproductive. But, as I said earlier, for over 100 countries, that's where they get to play. And that's worthwhile. It really is worthwhile. Uh, uh, Tom knows this from his experience in Greece and Bosnia and Cyprus. There's a lot of countries that feel the U.S. just never talks to them. I remember my first ambassadorship 25 years ago in Vienna when I had the Moroccan over in a group of six um, others for lunch and the residents and this gentleman happened to be about twice my age at the time, and he said, you know, this is the first time I've ever been in an American ambassador's residence. The UN gives you the opportunity to reach out in a cost-effective way that pays dividends. And just know George H.W. Bush, how many world leaders, how many heads of state when he was president are people he learned to know, spent time with, interacted with when he was the perm rep in the early 1970s. The Human Rights Council, um, we all know its problems with respect to its uh, Israeli focus, its effort to delegitimize uh, Israel, um, its light touch on other issues like Darfur. Let me just tell you a story. Here's the problem, and it's not just that we said those are all terrible Arab states and stuff. What captures so much of the problem of the UN, I'm sitting in the Security Council, something's happened. Syrians going to introduce a resolution saying that Israel's evil, mean, and nasty, and whatever. And so I talked to uh, Michael uh, Webbe, the Syrian who was a good friend, and said, look, I can abstain on this and this, but if you do that, I'm going to have to vote no. He said, ah, I can't, I, I, I've been back and forth, I'm going to have to include that. And I said, okay, okay, as long as we all know what we have to do. So he goes in, he gives his speech. Then they go around. Now this is a day after the quartet met. Kofi, EU, Russia, the U.S. The resolution contradicted almost everything in there. 
the British ambassador who's next to me speaks out in favor of the resolution. And then, as everyone knew, speaking 14th, I said, if it's included, we will vote no. Then Sergei Lavrov says, well, if the Americans would do that, let's not call for a vote. So we all have done that and could go out and say we did what we did. So I turned to Ambassador uh, Eldon and I said, How, this is contradicts what Tony Blair said yesterday. How can you do this? And he laughs. He says, ah, oh, Rich, don't take it so seriously. This is just politics. It doesn't matter. It was internal UN politics. It was sucking up to a large constituency. That happens every day. And you say, oh, how could he do that against his interest? It was in his interest. Because he had other issues with the Arabs that he was going to want to trade off later. Furthermore, Britain and France have a perhaps well-deserved Rodney Dangerfield complex of not getting enough respect. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be a perm rep, so they're constantly looking at things where they can try to reach out to uh, the G77. On UN peacekeeping, I'd argue it makes, and Timur Leach did, did a great job. Ethiopia Eritrea, it was just a holding pattern, but it was necessary to start, see, Princeton, how do I say this, two energetic leaders from not doing things they both knew they no longer wanted to do after 80,000 people were killed in 40 days. Um, after the problem, the initial problem with Sierra Leone, the Brits came in heavy and, and it was invaluable there. Much to my surprise, it made a real contribution in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I didn't think it was going to be a big enough footprint with 15,000, but it did help move to the election. Congo is still uh, a work in progress, but, but the UN played a critical role. Notwithstanding uh, Srebrenica in Bosnia, the UN has and continues to play a role. Um, and with all its problems, the AU-UN hybrid force in Darfur has increased the security footprint. At the same time, a lot of its failures are our fault, not the UN's. There's a wonderful two candid paragraphs in Madeleine Albright's memoirs of her time as Secretary of State, but others could write it if they were willing to be as just candid, where she talks about they decided just to offload problems that were intractable onto the UN. Because there's a political need, you gotta do something. You know, you just don't stand there, you gotta do something. So when you can't, when you, for whatever reason you've calculated, you really don't wanna do anything, then you say, well, we'll, we'll send it to the UN. So, you know, let's not pretend that the Amer United States isn't blameless in some of these problems. Yes, that needs management reform, the OI, OS investigative unit has not been beefed back up. Um, the fifth committee has danced around it. One could argue that Ban Ki-moon has uh, not shown the leadership he should. Um, budget reform, I was telling Princeton yesterday, when I was assistant secretary, we really, we, we, we were committed and we worked and that we put together one of these committee of experts. I think it was 17, I can't remember. There's some number of experts. Ambassador Jose Susano was in, and we got agreement. You had to have consensus to get the budget. So now the United States had them where we wanted them, without us. But unfortunately, I was followed by uh, Assistant Secretary by this really wimpy, weak guy who refused to do that, John Bolton. <laughs> so the United States has never done it, but the power's there. Um, there needs to be administrative reform, but. I would suggest to you uh, waste, uh, fraud, and abuse is a perennial in the U.S. government, too, so let's at least keep it in perspective. Um, as I said, there, there are big issues. I think they have to, they've not responded from the Volcker Commission and the Oil for Food scandal correctly in doing, especially an in internal audit. Uh, as noted earlier, the Human Rights Council disproportionately goes to the acceptance and legitimacy of the UN, especially in the United States, which is why I think it's good that the administration has decided to rejoin the Human Rights Council and try to make a difference 
because as long as you can point to whatever it is, 48 anti-Israel resolutions, no strong resolution on Zimbabwe, no strong resolution on Burma, no strong resolution on uh, Sudan, you're going to have a hell of a hard time to tell most Americans they should pay more money to the UN. So I think the administration's right to get in the game and try to change it. Um, and on the Security Council, the way I'd say it is the more it does not reflect the power balance in the real world, the more it will lose legitimacy. And this is a real problem for the hundred and whatever countries for whom the UN is it. And it's a pretty big problem for most of the next 90 for whom the UN is very central. And it's somewhat of a problem for the United States. Because we have a lot of other ways to do our business. Hopefully it's going to be able to be addressed. Hopefully reforms are going to be possible. I hope my great-grandchildren live to see it. But I'd say the most important thing is the United States has to be more realistic about what the UN can do, be more thoughtful of what we bring to the UN. I was very disappointed, one on substance and one on uh, symbolism by the speech in Prague. As I've already identified, I'm a Republican, so I'm a right wing nut. Um, <laughs> I don't think a nuclear free world's good. No, I've had debates with my friend George Schultz about it. Furthermore, if you had a nuclear free world, what would Russia be? Now, guys, what are the chances? They'd be a third world country without it, so they're not. <laughs> but more importantly, the president, I think, correctly made a strong statement about North Korea and the missile launch. But then he made statements similar to the following, and we won't accept it, we will not stand for it, we will demand that it change, we will prevent it, and we will send it to the UN Security Council? <laughs> Where nine days later, and the whatever it is, it must be the dozenth anemic resolution passes, doesn't go any further than others. We should be realistic. And part of that realism, in my opinion, is if any of the Perm 5 have a strong view, you can stop something. If it's a tough issue, if the U.S. isn't really to work for it and really bleed, you're not going to get it. Now, that gives a huge advantage because other countries want a lot of things that only we can help deliver. And you can get a lot through it. But it's hard work. It's difficult. We shouldn't unfairly offload, and we shouldn't promise it can do more than it does. But finally, let me just go back to peacekeeping. I went through some of the places where it's been successful. Grand Corporation, not known as one of these liberal gumbaya institutions. Jim Dobbins, not known as one of the softest diplomats in the world have now produced a series of peacekeeping studies, beginning with Germany going through three different books, lot of number crunching that make the case for how cost effective UN peacekeeping is for the US to get US objectives met in post-conflict situations. I would argue we can look at some of those things the UN does well, like peacekeeping, where it has lots of problems, but where it really is enormous value added to our interest. We should put our shoulder to the wheel to help them get even better. And then as the path is worn for the contribution the UN can make, look at other institutional reforms because, again, while the UN is not central for the U.S. protecting its interests, it's very valuable and we benefit if it gets stronger. Thank you. Ambassador Williamson has agreed to, to take a few questions and there is a, a floor mic over here. Uh, so I think if you, if you, 
Are you going to bring the mic to people? Okay. There's a, a question over here. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Tim Barner, I'm an officer with the uh, finance portfolio in U local UNA. Uh, you mentioned the ability of the U.S. to project military power into all corners, and you actually you said diplomatic and economic and other powers. But I was interested in the comparison between the ability to project military power, we have a new Africa Command, uh, other places where we demonstrated that, and our ability to, to project diplomatic power. Do we have enough diplomats? Do we have enough people both in uh, service to the United Nations for what the challenges are that you've mentioned as well as uh, here in Washington? There have been some remarks, including by the Secretary of Defense in the past year. I was curious on your comments. Well, uh, a couple quick uh, observations. First, we do have AFRICOM. I'm convinced no one, including AFRICOM Command in Stuttgart, has any idea what their mission is. <laughs> And so far, they have done nothing anywhere. But since we're putting a lot of money into it, I hope they figure out what they want to do and can find some place in Africa that will let them deploy to. <laughs> Second, there's absolutely no question that uh, the balance, really, for some time between the security and the diplomatic side as advocates for foreign policy and national security policy in the United States, in my opinion, has uh, been out of balance with the security side dominating more and more. And part of it is how we train FSOs, how we move them versus the Army. They're smarter about how they do it. But the fact is that Republican and Democrats, the security side dominates too much in the discussions. So that's second point. Third point, no question, we need more trained diplomats. I am a, you know, as a, as a political appointee that is a, a repeat offender of going back and forth, uh, I think uh, now uh, five or six times to the State Department, I believe that FSOs are generally the smartest fe uh, federal employees we have. I think, uh, unfortunately, the reward system rewards bilateral, not multilateralism. So if you're ambitious and smart, you stay away from the UN. There's no money to be made. And so the result is, I mean, I wrote an article about this in the Washington Quarterly 25 years ago. The result is every senior American diplomat in the UN is dealing with somebody who's in their fourth or fifth tour in UN-related stuff, and invariably ours don't have that experience, and unfortunately not all diplomats are as talented as Tom Pickering to pick it up in the first three hours. <laughs> so we're constantly at a disadvantage. Um, but also, when I served as Assistant Secretary for George Schultz, he had a real love for the institution and had a respect for institution building and building up FSI and stuff, and, and I don't think that's uh, there. But ultimately, uh, if the Secretary of State is a dominant voice, not necessarily the, but a dominant voice in setting policy, the diplomats are energized, more creative, and more productive across the board. And I, I, I make no judgment on our current Secretary of State, but I think uh, there has not been that type of uh, capacity for 16 years. So uh, my own hope is that Secretary Clinton can change that. But I think that's also been a problem. Um, more questions? Uh, Tom, do you want to come here or yeah. here? Here's the microphone. Well, Rich, uh, I, I really do appreciate your comments and the fact that it comes from Republican even more so. Um, <laughs> The question I have is, is, I think you've laid out as eloquently as I've heard in years uh, what the U.S. interest and why the U.S. should have an interest in multilateral diplomacy, particularly around the U.N. <coughs> but we still have a really rotten 
attitude on the Hill. And my question is, how do you, you know, and, th and that's been going on for years. And um, I know we in the State Department tried to do what we could to, you know, to, to just get some of the facts out there. The, the, the RAND study you, you cite on peacekeeping is a perfect example. You can, you can ab accomplish your objectives, you know, with much uh, uh, more effective use of, of resources multilaterally sometimes than bilaterally. Now, how do you solve the Hill conundrum? Um, politics uh, has, has various dimensions. One is how, how broadly an issue is supported, but also how intensely an issue is supported. And the reason we've seen a distortion in campaigns in the last 20 years, probably longer, is that you may only have 10% of the people who are actually going to vote based on right to life or not right to life. But that's what they're going to vote on. And it doesn't matter what else you have. That's the UN's problem. As I like to point out, in my lifetime, there is only one American politician, I think, who's been elected to office on the issue of the United Nations. Only one. People like Jim Leach, they never talked about the UN back in Iowa and stuff. His name was Pat Moynihan and he attacked the UN for 14 months for um, Zionism is racism. So you've got a fundamental problem there. Second, you've got, especially in hard times, I'm, I'm worried about this populist uprising we saw with the AIG bonuses. I think it's gonna lead to more demand for protectionism and to bring back home. And so if you have that generally, you even have it more of some foreign body that's in Manhattan. I think you have to take its successes, what it does, and you just gotta sell that on Capitol Hill because there are people that care about terrorism that have to be better educated in what it does. There are people that care about post-conflict situations. There are people that care about humanitarian assistance of Frank Wolfs and others. But it's always gonna be tough because there's no political money to be made on the UN. I'd like to, um, as a prerogative of being here right now in front of the microphone, uh, add to that, and that is that it's a, it's a challenge to the United Nations Association uh, and all of its chapters to uh, be as informed as we can, and then uh, our mission to inform the general public and, and uh, strengthen the, our, our advocacy programs. I think that that can, that is the kind of grassroots and general public support that our, our elected representatives need to, need to be aware of. They, if they're not hearing from us, then they think we either don't care or that we support the, the, the noisy minority that's, that's opposed to the United Nations. And so that's, that's part of our challenge. And it's a challenge, I think, that at this time of, of possibilities is one that, that I'm glad that we're, we're in a position to, to try to meet. I think we have time for another one question. Female. A female question. Okay. You, you have a challenge, females. <laughs> Not sure how I feel about being the female question, but... Um, <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Latham. I run the U.S. Committee for the United Nations Development Program. Ambassador um, Williamson, I, I updated my Facebook status in the middle of your talk saying I was getting a great pep talk about the U.N. from you. And then you started to go downhill and some things that weren't as peppy, and I was sad. But, um, <laughs> but you have a good Facebook review anyways. Um, <laughs> I think all people who believe the U.N. should play a role are both happy and sad by definition. <laughs> True. Um, we're bringing the UN resident representative um, to Washington, D.C. next week, and um, I'm just curious, with all of the things that have gone, in, gone on in Sudan um, recently, what your take is on the impact of the U.S. NGO movement um, the, on, you know, their advocacy um, and how that's impacted the situation on the ground for um, the UN and also the NGOs. Thank you, that, that's really uh, a good point to, to, to close on actually. Let me first say that uh, I think uh, Karen's absolutely right that the constant 
grassroots interest. Uh, something the Stanley Foundation has done for years, bringing um, congressional members and senior staff, as well as from the executive department together to discuss these issues, really helps because it energizes them more. And the various UNA chapters, and I wish Tom all the luck in the world because it's a tough but important job. Say, so is Fred Tipson over? We were in law school together. Say hi to Fred. He calls me every once in a while. Um, but I think that's a good question because I, in, in, in quarter century plus that I've done foreign policy in and out of government, never have been involved with a single issue where there's been such grassroots interest. I think, in fact, Cynically, it's in part because Hotel Rwanda came out about the time that the genocide started, so people saw that and it resonated with something that they'd seen and were offended by. But whatever the reasons, it's incredible how many Americans are energized on this issue. And the consequence is not only this huge lobbying arm, grassroots in Washington, <clears throat> I think I got over a quarter of a million emails after I initially was announced. To, uh, I changed that email address fast. But anyway, um, but there is this huge grassroots. And it's also evidence in how many NGOs were there. Tom used to run an NGO that was active there. <clears throat> Darfur is as bleak a place as you would ever want to go. And unfortunately, I visit a lot of bleak places. And the insecurity is substantial. You have had genocide of some 400,000 people, 2.7 driven away from home. And somehow Darfur has awoken in people a question about why we can't live up to never again. 2.7 million people who had members of their family killed, their village burned down, their crops destroyed, their livestock stolen, their wells poisoned, the women from seven years old up to old women beaten, gang raped repeatedly, then hot knives branding their thighs so they can't hide the shame. And every day there are hijackings going on and in this environment, every single day, there were 17,000 humanitarian workers who put at risk their lives to get food, medical supplies, other assistance. 1,000 of them are international, a disproportionate number of whom are American. These are incredibly brave people that have kept folks alive. One of the challenges the new administration now faces is that after the arrest warrant of President Omar al-Bashir, he's kicked out 13 of the most significant NGOs servicing over a million people. But I would say there is no place I've seen, and I've been to literally dozens of conflict zones over the years, Nowhere I've ever seen a more successful, vital, and necessary NGO humanitarian assistance. And a lot of it only functioned because of the over billion dollars worth of food from WFP that was going there. So this couldn't have existed without the UN. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think I'm going to call you rich because everyone else is, but I, I really do uh, respect Ambassador Williamson for all of the experience that he has brought to our time together here today. Um, I do have just a, a, a couple of, of announcements that I'd like to make. Um, I started out by, by uh, praising the planning committee for this session, but I especially want to single out Andy Rice, who um, brought us through this planning process. And he's uh, been a hero of, of mine for, for some time. And, and I also, I was pleased that uh, Rich pointed out the, 
the uh, outstanding work and support that we've had from uh, Richard Stanley over, over the years. Um, just in general, the, the support he's given to, to educating and to the, the nonprofit community to, to, to know the issues. And I like to take that a next step so that we know how to advocate for the issues. Um, I want to uh, also just bring your attention to, there's a nice little blue folder, uh, brochure in your blue folder. Um, I've already collected um, one new membership today, and uh, I've talked with three other people who said, um, I'm going to sign up uh, today, so, so this, there is an easy way for you to do that. You can just fill in that little form and write out a little check. Um, and then I, I want to close by saying that we are now moving into uh, the time in our program with three breakout sessions. I know that we've all been doing a lot of synapsing and thinking about the issues, and now is our opportunity to talk. These are going to be uh, not panels, but facilitated conversations. And so uh, there are three different sessions. And um, I think I'd, I'd like to ask you to come up and, and explain to us where the different sessions are meeting. And again, I want to thank you all for coming and for staying because we want to hear and learn from you. Hello. I'm going to, um, my name is Shantala. I'm the conference associate. I'm just going to explain to you about the three breakout sessions. If you have your blue folder and you pull out your um, program, on the second page of the program, where it says 2 o'clock p.m., um, there's a description of the three breakout sessions. The first one is relations between the United States and other Western states, and the G77 is a grand bargain on UN reform possible. This, pro this will be discussed in the auditorium, where we had all of our morning sessions. The second breakout session is the challenge of UN budgetary and management reform. What should be the relative authority of the UN Secretary General and the UN General Assembly? This will be on the fourth floor conference room. We're on the sixth floor right now. So if you take the stairs down two floors, yes, take the stairs, um, two floors down, you'll find the conference room right there. We have volunteers standing to help direct you if you need to. And then the final session number three is Security Council Reform. How can the Council and other major UN organs be brought into line with the changing global distribution of power? Um, this will be on the sixth floor um, boardroom, right outside the door where the coffee break session was. The two double doors is the sixth floor boardroom. Um, I hope that answered all of your questions. Um, go ahead, you can ask. Um, sure, you have, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> if anybody else has any questions for me, I'll be right over there next to the exit sign. Oh, Ed would also like to make an announcement. <clears throat> um, some of you may have noticed that there are two publications, one called uh, Revitalizing the United Nations Reform Through Weighted Voting. It's a published monograph and another uh, not yet published work also on Security Council reform uh, that deals with weighted voting and uh, at considerable expense they were sent here. We don't want to have to carry them away. We invite you to take one and I think there are, if you have a, an, a possible recipient for another, you might take two but wait until everyone has had a chance to pick up one uh, before you do so. But uh, we, we wouldn't like to have to carry them back to Minnesota in my case or, or elsewhere. So please do help yourself to those publications there. They're without cost. Thanks very much. Just one, co one comment the uh, about the panels this afternoon. I would hope particularly that the panels would focus on the second dimension of, of this conference, namely actions by and through the Obama administration. I hope we can make it as practical as possible and would like to hear from all the participants about their own ideas and how we can move forward. Again, how, how, how. Thanks very much.